All right, first thing I need to do is apologize for I was supposed to get this talk last month and I didn't make it. Uh, the reason was because I came down with COVID and you guys are very lucky that I didn't make it, that I felt so lousy I didn't come here because they only diagnosed me the day after this talk. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is the Pantanal. Now, it's in Brazil and everybody knows about the Amazon, but remarkably few people know about the Pantanal. It's the world's biggest swamp stroke wetland. It's, uh, when it's fully flooded, it's 195,000 square kilometers. So that's 10 times the size of the Okavango Delta, which is only 17,000 kilometers square. Now, why did I go there? Well, in 2012, <clears throat> I went into the Peruvian Amazon and I came out two weeks later vowing never again. I am not going into the Amazon. The Amazon is a nightmare if you are a birder or a bird photographer because everything is 40 meters above your head in the canopy. And if you try, so you can barely see it. And then when you try to photograph it, okay, it's into the light. So it's, it's plain impossible. And then there are, uh, it's very humid, it's very sticky, and it's just generally all around horrible. It also has a lot of bugs. Now, I thought Africa had bad bugs, but when you get into the South America, you're into a different world. So let me kick this off with a bit of medical pornography. Anybody know what a chigger is? A chigger is a mite. It's so small you can barely see it, and it lives in leaf litter. And the Amazon is wall-to-wall -wall leaf litter. You're constantly walking in leaf litter, and these things get on you, and they bite. And you feel nothing for half an hour, and then you start to itch. And that's when you make your biggest mistake. You scratch. And then these things, they, they can get septic on you. So to, to try and avoid chiggers, um, it's quite a mission. You have to spray your the bottom of your trousers, your socks, and the top of your boots. Now, tabard uh, with authentic repellent. Tabard and peaceful sleep don't cut it. Amid the uh, the mites, the, the chiggers think that's just flavoring. You need to, you need to get this American stuff. It's called DEET. 70 or 80% DEET, which was a repellent formulated by the American Army for Vietnam. In 2012, I couldn't buy it here because it's banned in South Africa. They don't, you know, so, so you spray the bottoms of your trousers with DEET, and then you spray where your shirt tucks into your trouser tops, you spray there because that's the other way that they get in. And then you've got to follow some pretty basic rules, like you cannot put your camera bag or your backpack down on the forest floor because the mites get onto that. And then when you put it back on your back, they're now above the uh, the exclusion zone. So this is just to show you why you may think I'm a wuss, but uh, I do not like bugs and I do not like the Amazon. So the hell with it. Okay. So then I heard about the Pantanal and I thought this sounded good. It had most of the same birds, most of the same mammals. It's a wetland. It's open. You go around in boats and it's got a lot of islands covered in open savanna like African. So you've got the same birds and you can see them. So I thought, right, that's, that sounds like my kind of turf. I'm going to go there. Uh, now, so there is the, uh, there's the Pantanal, center of, center of um, South America. It's on the western side of Brazil. It uh, gives you a bit of a schematic. Uh, it borders two other countries, <clears throat> Bolivia and Paraguay. There's the Amazon at the top. And how do you get there? Internationally, you fly into Sao Paulo. From Sao Paulo, <clears throat> you get on a domestic flight and you fly to a town called Cuiaba. It's a two-hour flight. And then you get on a, a, a vehicle for the last 12-hour drive down to this place called the Joffrey. As an aside, um, there are plenty of domestic airlines flying in Brazil. The one we took from Sao Paulo to Cuiaba was called Gol, G-O-L. And in those circumstances, fly Gol. It's the Brazilian version of Ryanair. It's it's worse. Okay, so so the best, in my humble opinion, the best Brazilian airline is Latam, and also just for interest's sake, at the moment there are no direct flights South Africa to Brazil, uh, but Latam is supposed to. In, Latam is apparently coming back from July. It's going to give a direct flight job, job example. Okay, now when you when you the the, the, the drive, you get onto this. Road is called the Trans Pantanera Highway, which is a bit of a misnomer, but that that runs several hundred kilometers down from the top of the Pantanal 
down into the center of it or the top of the center. Now, the Pantanal, <clears throat> it's not all wildlife sanctuaries. It's a lot of it is ranching country. Um, so, uh, and down that road, which is a horrible road, it's very dusty and it's very it's full of potholes, um, corrugations. So nothing, nothing a South African can't handle. But down that road, there are various lodges that you can stay in, okay, which are north of the main water area. But the road it ends at a place called Porto Joffrey, which is a village on, on one of the big rivers feeding into the Pantanal. This is uh, this boat here is the one that was going to take our luggage down. That's the boat that took us down. And there are a lot of, um, in fact, nearly all the lodges are at Porto Joffrey. But there's one big problem with Porto Joffrey. It's an hour's run by fast motorboat from Porto Port Joffrey south to the main Jaguar area. So if you're staying in Porto Joffrey, you've got an hour's run down in the morning and an hour's run back in the evening. Unless, of course, you stay where I stayed which is the South Wild Flotel, Floating Hotel, smack bang in the middle of the Jaguar area. Hi, I can highly recommend it. And <clears throat> I want to talk a bit about this company, South Wild. I booked this trip through <clears throat> a bunch called Nature Trip, which is a UK eco-tour company, which I've used before, very good company. But when we got on the trip, it, what they had done was they had subcontracted this entire trip to South Wild because we used their guides, their vehicles, their boats, their accommodation, and they were superb, really superb. Um, it's an it's an American United States company. It's it's got various setups throughout South America for various key animals like harpy eagle, mountain lion, and in every area. The, the, there's, a, there's a resident biologist in the camp. They've got some scientific research going on. They interact with the, the locals. So in the case of the jaguars, um, they have a deal with the farmers around the area. So the jaguar kills uh, one, of the, one of the cattle. They pay out the farmer to avoid the jaguar being shot. So if I go back to South America, I'm going straight to these guys. Right, now, jaguars. When I, I, the trip is called just Jaguars, right? I booked it for the birds. And they had all this hype about great Jaguar sightings. And I frankly didn't believe them. I thought Jaguars in the Pantanal are going to be like leopards in the Kruger. You know, if you're lucky, you see one. If you're really lucky, you get a picture. Well, I was totally, I'm glad to say I was completely and utterly wrong. In five days in that central area, I had, we had 12 separate Jaguar sightings. And most of them, in fact, all of them were under 50 meters. It was it was spectacular, spectacular. Mm -hmm. Now, why do you see so many jaguars there? The reason is that they live on two main prey species. Um, this, is, this is the, the caimans, which is a kind of crocodile, and capybaras, which is an oversized hamster. <laughs> and both the caiman and the capybaras live on the edge of the water. So that's where the jaguars are. They're there hunting them. And they, what, what has happened with the jaguars is over time, they've become used to the motorboats because you go everywhere on a boat. You don't walk, you can't walk. Okay, so it's on a boat. The jaguars have gotten used to the boats, so they ignore the boats. They ignore you. Um, and then you get these incredible sightings. Now, the first thing that you learn about jaguars is they love water. They swim like you can't believe. And it's quite, it's quite something to see. You know, I remember seeing a leopard once in, uh, in Wangi in Zimbabwe. It, it had rained and a leopard was walking down a tar road, a lot of puddles. And every time he put it, when he brought a paw up, he flipped it <laughs> to get rid of the water because they hated water. And here these guys are swimming. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned that they had a biologist in the camp. And they study the jaguars and they're able to tell individual jaguars by the, by the markings, mainly the facial markings. And they've got, I think it was 65, they've got, a, they've got a, an archive of 65 individual jaguars that have been spotted 
in that area. Now, the way it works is if you, and, and they're always asking you for photographs because they want to see there's a new Jaguar. And if you happen to photograph a new Jaguar, um, you get naming rights. You can, you can name that Jaguar. So meet Mick Jaguar. <laughs> this, this Jaguar was spotted by a guy and he wanted to name it. He called it Mick Jaguar. Now, Mick Jaguar is famous. Okay, now this is not by picture. This is off the internet. Mick Jaguar, about two years after he was identified, was filmed or videoed by a tourist killing a Cayman. And uh, these, I mean, again, this is off the internet. That's why the quality is not so great. But I mean, that's uh, uh, what the biologist was telling us that apparently the Jaguar, it, the power of its bite is the greatest of all the big cats. So when it grabs a crocodile like that, it actually crushes the back of its head. So the crocodile is is, is tickets. Right? So you know you look at these. You know we heard the story of Mick Jaguar, and you think, hell, you know, what are the chances? A once in a lifetime stuff. What are the chances? Well, yeah. I came close. Here's a jaguar which we got thirty meters from. He was looking around, and he spotted something in the water below, and in he went, and he came out with. A lizard. <laughs> he caught a baby. He came in, but uh, so close, but no cigar, as they say. Okay, now, how do you get these pictures? Right, that's how you get them. The jaguars do not care about you. They are totally unfazed by the boats. That boat, the front of that boat, is probably six, seven meters from the jaguar. Sorry. Yeah, they, yeah, 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 yeah. They, they ignore you. Okay, they're used to the boat. If you get out of the, if you were to get out of the boat into the bank, I think they'd, they'd run. You know, but but so long as you're in the boat, no problem, no problem at all. The one issue with all these boats is it gets a bit crowded at times. Uh, the, the closest comparison I can get to this is the Ngorogoro Crater in Tanzania, where you know where there's a lion kill sighting. All the vehicles. They're allowed to go off road and they gather around. So here, um, and they're in radio contact. So, 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 so the, the the boats concentrate on a jaguar sighting, which again is why it's so nice being in the in the flotel because in the morning you've got an hour to use for the area to yourself before the mob gets there. Then in the evening you've got an hour again, you know, when the mob has to head back up the river. And occasionally you get into very narrow channels, very shallow water. I, I call this the, uh, the, the photo gunboat. Uh, I would love to work out the value of the camera equipment there. <laughs> now, this is the next thing, okay? Um, Jaguars are half the story. There's another major predator in this area of the Pantanal. These are giant river otters, and they're huge. I mean, a full-grown adult is twice the size of our Cape Clawless otter. And the Spanish name for them is Los Lobos del Rio, which means river wolves. And it's, it's so appropriate because they hunt in a pack, and that pack is an extended family. You can get five of these guys together. And they are spectacular. I mean, two or three of these are a match for a jaguar. A jaguar will back off. And they're also incredibly cute. Um, this is an adult with two half-grown cubs. And same story as the jaguars. They, they, they're they not fussed about the boat. They just don't care about you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were in, in the area, I think there were five separate families that we used to see on a regular basis. We saw them every time we went out. There was a, there was an advert years ago for, I think it was for a, like Cadbury's lunch bar, where the one says to the other, can I have a wee bite then? You know, and this is what that picture reminded me of. Okay, now, this, this, is, a, this is one of these otters eating, that was like a five-foot eel. And all this happened right next to our boat. The otters were around the boat, and they went down. And, and in fact, the otters were so close that you couldn't photograph them. They were there. 
Then the otters went down and these bubbles came up around the boat. And the next minute, this huge burst of cloud of blood came to the surface. And, the, and three of these otters came up with this eel and they promptly chopped it in half. And the one guy got half of it and he went, I don't know, eight meters from the boat into the reeds and he sat there and he ate it. Now, I had a, I was using a Zoom camp, 200 to 500 Zoom, and I was taking these pictures, I think, on 300. That's how close they were. Uh, obviously, eating an eel is quite tough. Not, not friendly looking. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, these are these are main characters. Dude. I don't think. Okay. Now, then, then the final, the final mammal or print, you know, that the uh, that that people like to see in South America is this one. This is an ocelot, and it's about the size of a caracal, and it's completely nocturnal, and they are incredibly difficult to see. But South Wild. It's got two lodges in the Pantanal. It's got the Flotel. And then north of Porto Joffrey, on the way down the Transpantera Road, they've got a second lodge, which is in Woodland. And they've got a setup for these ocelots where they put out food in the evening. And um, they reckon that normally two out of three or two out of four nights, you would see it. And uh, we were lucky. We were there three nights. We saw it. And the way they've got it set up, you're not allowed to use flash. They've got a sort of a diffuse overhead light <clears throat> on the area. And uh, these pictures are taken at about 6,000 ISO. Okay, mammals, the, the Pantanal and I think the Amazon in general uh, is not very good for mammals. They, um, they can't, they just don't come anywhere near what we're used to in Africa. This is a crab eating fox, nocturnal. This is a Kotimundi, which is a sort of a king-sized genet cat. This is a, this is the biggest animal in uh, biggest mammal in southern. This is a tapir. Very strange animal. Okay, now to come back to the the floating hotel, um, I know that uh, you double rugged. Exploration types are quite happy to go and sleep outside on the ground with the anacondas and the tarantulas and all the rest of it. But in my in my advancing years, I like a bit of comfort. And this flotel hit the spot. It was fantastic. <laughs> okay, so I did this trip in 2019, so it was before COVID. But on the river, a lot of people cover up because you're constantly exposed to the sun, both directly and then the glare off the water. So you see a lot of people with full full face masks. This is a boat driver from one of the lodges up at uh, Porto Joffrey. You can see how she's covered up, full face mask, and then she's got long sleeves right down onto her hands. This is the same boat driver without the mask. I took this picture purely out of academic interest because if you look closely, you can see that book she's got in her hand is a guide to the birds of Brazil. So clearly this is a boat driver who wants to become a guide. You know, so uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> then you get some you get some interesting sights. You take all these motorboats around you and you look around, you know, you get some <laughs> interesting looking wildlife types. I don't know how effective that hat is in the book. <laughs> Okay, bugs. I mentioned the bugs in the Amazon. Uh, the main bug, this was September, the main bug that I encountered here were, were horseflies. These are all horseflies that you can see hovering over the head of the stalk. This is a Jabiru stalk, which is the South American version of a marabou stalk. And, but really, there the, the weren't an issue, okay? So long as you, I didn't get bitten at all, but I wore long trousers and I wore long sleeve shirt. I mean, makes sense, doesn't it? You know, right? Well, it makes sense for some people, but not for others. If you are a Brit, and most of the people on my trip were Brits, they have this thing about the sun. You know, they don't see the sun. So when the sun comes out, they get into shorts. And despite the horseflies, so this character he got he got bitten to hell. <laughs> well, that's his problem. And then the other the other I wouldn't call it a bug, but you see a lot of these at night. This is a tarantula. That one is about the size of my closed hand, and there's plenty of them. 
Sorry? No? Um, I was going to ask if you have found one in your brief. No, 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 no. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the, question, the question was, did I ever get a tarantula in my room? The answer is no. The floating hotel is on water. Tarantulas can't get to you. And uh, no, no, it's, it's very civilized. You know, none, none of this roughing it. You know. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to get onto the birds, which is why I went there. And I'm not going to, Brazil has got something like 2,000 species of birds. Now, the whole of Southern Africa, south of the Canary and the Zambezi, has got about 980. So there's, there's, there's an enormous wealth of birds there. But I'm not going to bore you with pictures of all the various types, you know, what I call avian rats. I'm going to give you the, uh, what I call the iconic birds, the ones that you want to go to, the ones that you want to see if you go to South America. So you must know, um, who knows what this one is? Everybody knows what should know. What is it? It's a, it's, okay, correct. It's a toco toucan. It's, it's the biggest of the toucans. And uh, it was used in an advertising campaign 10, 20 years ago. I forget, I think it was for tea. But anyway, so, so it's very well known. It's about that size. It's quite a big bird. Yeah. It's about the size of a, it's bigger than a pied crow. Okay. No ways. No, 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 no. So, uh, so the, this is a bird that you definitely want to see. Now, the, the, this is the toko toucan. There's about, I think there's about 15 species of toucan altogether. And uh, another one that we got there is this guy. This is a chestnut-eared aracari. Basically, it's a toucan by, a, by another name. These pictures were taken at the, at the, the South Wild Lodge where we got the ocelots. They had a feeding area the food got put out every morning, and these birds just piled in. A sort of, but much, much bigger beak. Much bigger beak. Yeah. Um, how, question, sure. uh, I don't mind. Yeah. Uh, okay, fine. All right. Okay, fine. So the, uh, who's, heard, who's heard of the oven bird? This is an oven bird. The official name is Rufus or Nero, but it makes a nest like that, like an oven. So it's called the oven bird. This is the second rarest macaw in the world, in, in South America. This is a hyacinth macaw. There were a lot of them in the Pantanal. Spectacular bird. Now, this bird, this is, this is a, a potu. This is a great potu. Now, that bird is the size of a step buzzard. It's huge. Okay? Basically, it's, it's a, think of it as a night jar on steroids. And what they specialize in is hiding in plain sight. They find a broken branch or, or, a, or a stump, and they just sit on it, and their camouflage makes it blend in. They look like the stump. Now, you can't really see it so well here, but I've got another picture I'm going to show you. Um, this, this was not taken on the Pantanal. This was taken on a previous trip I did into Ecuador. This is a much smaller patu, a common patu. He's sitting on top of a bamboo, broken bamboo stump. Now, the guide, if I hadn't had a guide, I wouldn't have seen this bird. And even when the guide was pointing it out, I had to get within 15 meters of that bird before I finally saw it. That's how well camouflaged it is. Spectacular. Okay, that's the South American ostrich, the rhea. This is the, um, the bird that I showed you earlier, that like Jabiru stork, which is like a marabou stork. How do you get pictures like that? Well, those lovely people at South Wild put up a nest site for the Jabiru near, their, near one of their lodges. Um, and then once the birds are nesting, they put up a hide, a, uh, a very tall hide, that got onto the same level. So this is the top of about a 10 meter high tree. They put a hide up so that you could look across on the same level as the nest. This is a, uh, a roseate spoonbill. I think this one's in breeding plumage because look at the yellow head, which this next picture, this guy doesn't have it. This is a spectacular little bird. This is a vermilion flycatcher. 
And this bird goes right up through South America into the south of the United States. Okay, being a wetland, you would expect the Pantanal to have a lot of herons, and they do. This is a boat built heron, and it's a juvenile. And obviously, it's got its name from the shape of its beak. But if you look at the eyes, those huge eyes tell you that this is a night heron. So this is a South American version or in the same family as our black crown night herons and the, uh, the, 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 the rare one, uh, I forget the name. So we, we got this thing first thing in the morning. He was, during the day, they get into thick cover, they just bark, cough. But this guy was out first thing in the morning and he got, in, got a picture of him before he went into hiding. This is an agami heron. And... Very difficult bird to photograph because it sticks to the absolute darkest parts it can of 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 the of the of the of the, of the forest or the, or the, or the, or the lake. It, it it it's always in deep shade. It's always undercover. Um, real pain to photograph, but I got it. <laughs> it's a cat heron. I mean, these, these herons just knock our herons into the shade. This is a whistling heron. And again, spectacular colors. Now, th this, is, this is one of the most iconic of the South American birds. This is a sun bitten. And it's sort of a cross between a, a, an ibis, a heron. Um, and what it does, uh, you may have seen pictures of it. It's, it's, been, it's in a number of documentaries. It, when it feels threatened, it spreads its wings and it and then hunches down and, 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 and spreads the wings at you. And the wings, on the outside of the wing, there's a huge, big, glaring round. Of, you know, it looks like an emperor moth. It's trying to make itself look big. Unfortunately, I, I, couldn't, get, I couldn't get a shot of it doing that. This is a little blue heron, which is on the South African list because 10 years ago, one of them pitched up Cape Town. So this, this is the adult. And just to make it interesting, this is the juvenile, which if you didn't, you know, if you took a quick look at it, you might say, well, cat leader, but it ain't. This is a kokoi heron, which is the same size as a gray heron, uh, but the markings on it are quite a bit more dramatic, contrast. And this is a rufescent tiger heron. Again, beautiful bird. Okay, raptors. Um, there are a lot of vultures in, in South America, but they're different to ours. Th these are black vultures, and they're what's known as neotropical vultures. They're, they're, they're different to ours. Ours are old world vultures. Uh, the obvious difference you can see here, it, it's a smaller bird and it's got a much narrower bill. But the big difference is these vultures can smell, ours can't. And obviously, uh, it's very handy if you're, if you're looking for carrion over, over forest, you know, you can't see what's on the ground. And I remember there was a, one of Attenborough's documentaries way back, one of his first bird documentaries. He proved this. He took a piece of rotten meat and he buried it in the leaf litter underneath um underneath uh, forest cover. And then he went off to a hide and sat and waited. And within an hour, one of these guys came in, landed, dug up the meat. So these are black vultures again. And there's a number of vultures uh, similar build. This is a turkey vulture. This, this vulture goes all the way up into the United States, as does the black vulture. And then another variation on the theme, this is a lesser yellow-headed vulture. This is a southern crested caracara, very common. Again, goes right up through Mexico into, into Texas. And they, they are total scroungers. They, they hang around your lodge. And they're like chickens almost, you know, not scared of you, and they're forever looking for scraps. Like a yellow bull kite, yeah, yeah. And um, 
Yeah, I thought these two are Heckle and Jekyll, dear. <laughs> okay, this is a savanna hawk, and the um, South America is quite unusual. It's got a number of hawks which have got orange in the wing. Now, Africa, none of our hawks have got orange in the wing. There's one in West Africa, a grasshopper buzzard, which has some orange. But uh, the number of species of hawk in South America which have this orange wing pattern. Uh, luck, effort. Uh, the flying one. The flying one. Now, the flying ones, you... Well, well, first of all, you need to get close. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay. And then, like this bird, you, you were sitting on a, a stump. And you need to predict which way he's going to go. And uh, if there's a wind blowing, that helps because he's going to fly into the wind. So, so if he's sitting here and the wind's coming from that side, he's going to go that way. So you, you learn after a while to kind of predict what the bird's going to do. But the key issue is get close. Uh, it gives him lift to take off. It's like an airplane. Airplanes take off into the wind. Airplanes land into the wind. They need the lift. This is a black-collared um, hawk. You can think of it as a poor man's osprey. It's, uh, it catches fish, but it's not as dramatic as an osprey. This is an adult. This is a juvenile. This is a, this is a crane hawk. Now, this is South, Af South America's version of the gymnogy. It's the same kind, of, same kind of bird. It's got very long legs, and it specializes in stealing chicks from nests. And it can put those legs into a hole in a tree and feel around to get to get like woodpecker chicks or barber chicks and then pull them out. Nasty piece of wood. This is a great black hawk. South America could a lot of hawks. You worked out by now. And the closest comparison to this guy here would be a pale chanting goshawk. Very long legs. And he often hunts on the ground. He'll walk around, you know, scratching through bush looking for prey. This is a roadside hawk, which is kind of a cross between a sparrow hawk and a, and, a, and a buzzard. And then they have a skimmer, um, a black skimmer. It's identical to our African skimmer, except that the black skimmer has got a bill that's half black, half red. Our skimmer has got a completely red beak. Otherwise, it's the same bird. And again, this bird is on the South African list because, again, about 12 years ago, one of them pitched up the Cape Town. This is their, um, this is the, the South American version of the giant kingfisher. This is a belted kingfisher. It's, uh, it's, it's slightly smaller than a giant. And this is the South American version of the pygmy kingfisher. This is a South American pygmy kingfisher, uh, which is comparable to our African pygmy kingfisher. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, if you look at this, uh, a lot of the Pantanal is it's it's you know very similar to parts of the Zambezi Valley. It's a great destination. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, one of the best trips I've ever done. And uh, if you get the chance, you should go there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. What a what a fantastic talk. Let's let's take a, a couple of uh, couple of questions. We'll start with our live audience. Brendan, um, just repeat the question. Ask yeah, sure. So that our Zoom audience can have questions. I was there. Uh, the question was, how long was I in the Pantanal? I was, I was in the in the Jaguar area. I was there for five days, but the trip was just under two weeks in total. Ah, because I was curious about how you managed to photograph so many different kinds of birds. I don't know. We we had no no no. The, 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 I had nearly two weeks on the ground there. Yeah. You in fact, we stayed in three different lodges. Two of the uh, the question was where did I stay? I stayed. We stayed in three different lodges. Two of them were run by this company, South Wild, of which the the floating hotel that was really for the jaguars and the otters. And then the other two lodges 
we're in drier parts of, of the Pantanal, much more, less water, more savanna. Yeah. Is it? Yes? We, 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 we did some walking on, uh, so the question was, game view, do we use game view walk with vehicles or did we walk? Most of the time we were in a game viewing vehicle, but we, we did some walking, but around the camps, um, around the lodges. We didn't do long range hikes, which was just fine by me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, question is, what purpose to the um, the feathers sticking out of the back of the head of some of the herons? I think it's all to do with sex, my dear. I think I think it's the males and those those crests are supposed to make them more attractive to the female herons. Uh, I think. You know. No idea. Uh, uh, question: Why do toucans have such big beaks? Answer: I have no idea. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Lewis, any, um, any questions from the Zoom audience? Uh, Lisa said spectacular photographs and information. Thank you. Lucille also asked, why does a toucan have such a large beak? And uh, Charlotte asks, are there piranhas in that lake? And do boats ever tip? <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. I, 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 we, didn't, we didn't see any piranhas. And the guides didn't mention any piranhas, but they wouldn't, would they? So, uh, I mean, what we saw in the water where uh, we saw anaconda in the water, and, and there, there are a lot of fish in there, you know, what, what, what the otters were catching. Um, and, and also, what are the mammals that we saw, which was really interesting, but you know, impossible to photograph. They have bats that catch fish. Uh, it's amazing, you know, they come out at last light and you see that as you come back on the river, they fly across the river in front of you, and you, you saw a couple of them actually catching the fish, snatching the fish from the water like they were a fishing hook. But piranhas, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, there's no. The, the, it, it's, uh, the question is, can you fish there? Uh, I didn't see anybody fishing. I think it's I think it's a, it's a wildlife area. I don't think they're allowed to fish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from your any, any other comments from your side? No, all uh, those were all the questions on on the, the in line. Fantastic. Okay, so that that um, that brings us to the end of yet another brilliant talk by Brenda. I have to just say. Your, uh, your sense of adventure and your photography is, um, is truly inspiring. So many thanks for sharing it with us. And, uh, and we, we certainly look forward to your next adventure, which you maybe want to tell us what it's going to be. Uh, I, sorry, one comment on my sense of adventure. Please note, uh, I showed you the pictures of the uh, hotel <laughs> lodging. Okay, uh, maybe you double rugged bunch like getting out there and being uncomfortable. I'm at an age where I don't. I, I, I like my comfort. You can call me a wuss if you like. I call it common sense. So, uh, so uh, I, I, my, my sense of adventure is moderated. Uh, my next trip will be later this month. I'm going into Zambia to visit uh, Lake Bangwelu uh, and Kasanka National Park. Lake Bangwelu, I, I've always wanted to get there, but it's very difficult to get to this place. And uh, it's got apparently got herds of tens of thousands of black lechwe, which I want to see. It's also got the uh, Southern Africa's biggest concentration of wattled cranes. And then Kasanka National Park is allegedly the best place in Africa to see um, Sitatunga antelope, which are impossible to see. You have to go to the Okavanga Delta and you never see them because they hide in the reeds. So uh, that's happening end of May. Fantastic. Brendan, I'm just going to say 